Welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade, Coteries of New York. Once more, darkness falls upon the city. You wake up, same as you have these past few nights, in a windowless room. As you pry open the reinforced steel door, you look out the window to see, invariably, a sky bereft of sunlight. And then it hits you, the hunger. For a moment, you let yourself wonder if there will ever come a night when it's just not there. Given what you've learned thus far, you probably have as much chance of kickstarting your heart with jumper cables. You lock the apartment behind you and head over to Sophie's apartment. You did promise to call her, might as well not keep the lady waiting. And hey, what else are you gonna do? Call him? She's probably worried. At least she will be once she actually tries to give you a call. Which might not happen for a few more weeks, months, if she's busy doing press for her new play piece. Oh, call M. Call him! I said- Call him! <laughs> no, call M. Right. My sister, I forgot. Yes, we have a sister. You could try to track down your sire if the sheriff hasn't done that already. After all, he did buy your painting. There has to be a money trail, right? But even so, what would you say to him? These thoughts put you in a weird mood. It's a strange sensation to walk the crowded streets, same as you have so many times before. But feeling so disconnected, all these people, you're not one of them. Not anymore. I kind of turn down my mind a little bit. You're a vampire, kindred, and you need to carve your own path in this strange new existence. One way or another. Appro appropriately enough, you arrive at Sophie's building just as that thought crosses your mind. A quick word with the security guard and you're let into the elevator. Apparently, Miss Langley is expecting you. Of course she is. You knock and wait patiently, as the footsteps on the other side grow closer. Finally, the door opens and Gregory, Sophie's driver, invites you in. You find the lady herself standing by the window, silhouetted against the city's moonlit midnight glow. She stares out, motionless, like a marble statue. Ooh, this is pretty. Just giving it a second, just because it looks pretty. Good evening, Sophie. She doesn't react immediately, but seems to snap out of some meditative state and looks at you with strangely blurry eyes. Yes. Good evening, Lamar. I was wondering, when you look out at this city, when you see the lights, hear the hum, smell the rain on the pavement, what do you think about? You gaze out. You thought the city couldn't surprise you anymore. You've lived here all your life, after all. But tonight something feels different. You realize in this moment that you have truly changed. Yes, you know what Sophie means. The way she gazed out that window and saw the truth beyond. You do the same. The view is fascinating. Each detail absorbing every angle of... Uh, yeah, I'm messing up here. Every angle, a new experience. The familiar made sublime. When you turn to Sophie again, she smiles at you knowingly. Ah, uh, so you understand. I had my doubts. But perhaps we are of shared lineage after all. You see, the blood that flows within me is that of Clan Toreador. There are thirteen such bloodlines among us, kindred, though that number has been contested in the past, and these nights it seems that nothing is certain anymore. The clans have gone by many effects over the years. Epith 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 epithets? I don't know if I'm saying that right. But the names of these nights have their roots in medieval times. The original Inquisition, if you can believe it. They use these, use these to categorize us, describe our inherent differences. In time, we adopted them ourselves. Each clan has a uniqueness about it, inescapable, originating from an ancient progenitor carried from sire to child. For the Toyador, the gift lies in a sensitivity of sorts. We are uniquely attuned to beauty and ugliness both. We can see either where most can't, 
cannot. I don't know why I said it like that. Where most cannot. A blessing on most nights occasionally a curse. The sheriff is of my clan as well. Although you'd be hard pressed to see him as such. Poor Quater, it breaks my heart to see him in this state. Still, there is a beauty to it as well. Nothing like a good fall from grace. Try as she might to act playful, you can tell she genuinely cares. She lets her gaze wander for a brief moment, but is quick to regain her composure. Then there are the Ventru, known for their pride and a proclivity to rule over others. The prince represents that clan, as is quite common in our society around the globe. Where the blue bullards think themselves rulers, like the Bruja like to see themselves as preeminent, 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 revolutionaries. They call for a universal rebellion while being slaves to their own temper. We don't discuss rabble much anymore. Not after they've largely blo broken off with the Camarilla. To think they were philosophers once long ago. I'm not doing the accent very well tonight. I'm sorry, guys. My throat kind of hurts, though. I hope to tell you more about some of the other bloodlines tonight. How can I tell a kindred's clan? Say I meet a vampire for the first time. How can I tell what their clan is? Usually, you cannot. With a few exceptions, perhaps. For some clans, the uniqueness I mentioned bleeds into their appearance or disposition, but even that can be misleading. Outside of a few specific cases, knowing one's clan is less important than understanding who they are, personally. What drives them, their wants and needs, weaknesses too. Speaking of which, we come to reason I want come to the reason I wanted to speak to you tonight. It is customary in our society, especially among younger kindred, to organize into coteries. Sometimes these are called by the prince themselves, or mandated by a fledgling sire. In our case, you may treat it as more of a strong recommendation. I want you to seek out companions, not because you need to learn more about our society, but also because it is useful. True friendships are rare among kindred, but having allies, even temporary ones, is something of a necessity these nights. We might be selfish creatures, but we are drawn to each other nonetheless. Where should I look for allies? Any suggestions on where I should start looking? I was just about to get to that. She puts on a mysterious smile. I spent some of my precious time last night asking around, pondering potential kindred for you to meet. Came up with a short list of contacts. I hope you'll appreciate the gesture. Forging a partnership with them might offer perspectives and viewpoints that I cannot provide. Lenses through which to view our kind. They are all members of the Camarilla, of course. More or less. Okay, who are they? Alright, then let's hear it. Who's on the list? You gotta learn about them, I see. Good, I'm glad. So let us start with the Chimia. They are a powerful clan, disliked by many, but feared and respected by many more. They have been an important pillar to the Camarilla since the very beginning. They are blood sorcerers. Blood sorcerers? You could swear you once saw them play at the Apollo. Probably not the same blood sorcerers, though. Sophie Snickers. Oh, child, don't be caught with that look on your face when you meet a warlock in person. They really are adept at using vitae, vite, their own as well as others, to unique and potent effects. Since they are quite rigid in their hierarchy, the kindred I had in mind for you might need some persuading. His name is Agathon. From what I hear, he is quite the scholar, very ambitious, the child of a noted Chimere here in New York. Owl Sling Stormbridge. 
Spend enough time with Agathon, and I'm sure you'll run into her sooner or later. Ice, Iceling or Aisling? I'm not sure. A chance to meet an important person, then. So by getting to know this Agathon, I can get closer to someone higher up the ladder. Yes, though not immediately, I would imagine. Owsling finds herself in a somewhat precarious position, both in the city and her clan. Every move she makes is heavenly scrutinized, thus she has learned to tread lightly. Anyway, if you wish to contact the young Tremere, I hear you can usually find him in a New Age bookstore out on Broadway. The Tremere have one of their workshops there. Gregory will give you the details. Now this ex next recommendation comes with a bit of a caveat. As you recall me saying, most bloodlines have unique features that might not be obvious at first glance. Well, there is one clan whose members wear the curse on their sleeve. The Nosferatu. Wait, Nosferatu? As in the German expression is classic? No way. No wonder they make their havens and sewers, abandoned buildings and such. The appearance is hideous and obviously unnatural. Had they walked the streets like other kindred, the kind would have learned of our existence long ago. Did she just shudder? It's hard to tell with her usual complexion, but you could swear her skin suddenly took on an even more sickly color. The one I have in mind isn't as big an asshole as the worst of them, but he is no Adonis either. Still, he has some talents and connections that you might find useful. His name is D'Angelo, and he has an office, for lack of a better term, in the otherwise abandoned grain terminal in Red Hook, right next to the one of those Swedish stores. The name escapes me, the one with the awful furniture. What connections does he have? You mentioned this D'Angelo has some useful connections. I was just getting to that. D'Angelo does our jobs for Quater, digging up dirt, locating kindred who would prefer to remain hidden, the kind of work the Nosferatu are best at. He's on a case right now, something to do with kind murders, I think. After your initial brush with our dear Sheriff, I think it would be wise to show some goodwill towards his agenda. Assisting D'Angelo with his investigation might just be the thing. She takes a brief pause to look out the window again. Now come the two more exotic proposals. Exotic, as if the blood mage and the vampire detective are business as usual. You may have heard about the Gangrel before. They are a wild clan, in touch with the beast in a way that others might not dare to attempt. They mostly keep out of big cities, but there are exceptions. Nominally, they haven't put a, been a part of the Camarilla for over two decades, but the one kindred I would like you to meet has strong, shall we say, familiar ties to the sect. Her name is Tamika. Her sire Jezebel was instrumental during the, new, the Battle of New York back in 1999, the very same battle that cemented the city as a Camarilla domain. Sadly, her achievements have gone largely unrecognized. Tamika and a number of her siblings still reside in the domain they were awarded after the battle, Prospect Park. Jezebel herself left the city some years ago, fed up with being underappreciated. Anything more about Tamika? You seem to know a lot about her sire, but is there anything else you can tell me about Tamika? I asked around out of all of Jezebel's child, uh, Tamika is known to be the most rational and cool-headed, at least for a gangrel. That said, she's likely to have a unique way of appraising your worth. I cannot say how exactly, but you should be prepared for an interesting conversation at the very least. Then again, that could be said of almost every kindred in this city. There's that mysterious smile again. 
So you say seeking out Tamika could prove quite educational, if nothing else. And who knows, perhaps you will find her temperament to be a welcome change of pace. But speaking of change of pace, I have one last suggestion for you, though it's one I don't, I don't make lightly. The kindred who calls herself Hope. She's a Malkavian. They are a uniquely cursed clan. For centuries we considered them mad, insane, unhinged. But those of us who spend enough time with them come to understand the truth. It is no sickness but a unique perception of the world that has them appear to us as unstable. And that perception can prove to be very valuable. Having him out gaming as your companion might be taxing on the nerves and a true test of patience at times. But their insight and intuition are unrivaled among kindred. As for Hope is specifically, she is said to be a recluse, but I have it on good authority that she can be currently found in an internet cafe. I believe it's called in Lower Manhattan. Gregory has the address. Where did you learn about her? Where did you learn about her exactly? One of my colleagues told me about her. He considers her uniquely talented and tapped into certain fad, current fads among kind. Not something I personally am personally interested in, as I'm sure you know by now. I take his word for it at any rate. Well, I believe it's that's all of them. I still have a few social calls to make tonight. So I'll leave you to it. Use tonight and tomorrow night to arrange some cordial visits, visits of your own. I will send Gregory for you as soon as I have further need of your services. Oh, that reminds me. You will need a car. Join us downstairs, won't you? She smiles once more and turns to her driver. He helps her put on her coat and the three of you leave Sophie's apartment. Sophie points to one of the cars near the building as Gregory hands you the keys. It's a rather inconspicuous compact car, a decent looking if not luxurious ride. Stay safe, Lamar. This is your first night alone. Don't let it be your last. As they drive away, you find yourself with more freedom than you've had for the past few nights. A blessing or a burden, time will tell. With a list of addresses in hand, you consider your next move. Okay. Ooh, what's this? I got. I, I. I'm gonna go for this one. Let's see. Yeah, we're gonna go with the Malkavian first because we love Malkavians. <laughs> okay, you meet Hope a recluse. Recluse a member of the Malkavian clan. She's supposed to hold up an inner cafe. Oh, you need to rest. Okay. So I can't do anything right now. All right, let's rest. You notice something strange by the front door of your haven. A letter has been slipped under the door in a cream-colored, old-fashioned envelope. There's no name on it, but you know it's meant for you. Opening the letter, it's clear it's been sent by someone incredibly old-fashioned, rich, or a fan of classic stationery. No normal person sends letters like this. The note is short and terse, written in elegant, delicate handwriting. You are cordially invited to rendezvous at the Cathedral of St. John and the Divine. I'll be waiting to make your, your acquaintance tomorrow night. Look for me closer to God. There is no other information. It looks like you have a mysterious invitation for the following night. Okay. Faith and Myth Part 1. You've received an invitation to meet a mysterious someone at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Alright, let's go. You haven't been to a church since you became a vampire, or a kindred as the euphemism goes. You've had to focus on concrete, practical things like survival and feeding. You've learned the essentials of the vampire experience, but you don't really have a clear idea of what it all means. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine is a New York landmark. You've been inside once before when you were much younger. You marveled at its gothic facade. facade. facade? Looking at it now from across the street, it feels ominous. The prospect of an anonymous invitation to a secret meeting is a worrying one, but the venue is well chosen. It's hard to imagine a violent attack in a place like this with eyes everywhere. 
You enter the cathedral discreetly. You've quickly learned this is an essential skill for a vampire, how to move without anyone noticing you. The full force of the cathedral's architecture hits you, ah, hits you as you walk between the pews. If the architect meant to create the feeling of being small in the face of God's glory, mission accomplished. Based on the note, you're assuming that whoever you're meeting is somewhere in the front. As you step closer to the high altar, it feels as if something is dragging at your feet, as if the stone beneath you resisted your movement. Does God still listen to you? It's been a long time since you prayed. You wonder whether God listens to creatures like you. Fatalistically, you take a step, then another. You're not sure if your God is present in this cathedral, but perhaps it doesn't matter. What you feel is real enough. There is an old man sitting in the front. You see only the back of his head, bowed down in silent prayer. Your footsteps echo on the floor and he turns to look at you. You can't take your eyes off him. He's tall, dignified, white hair, balding, a few strands escaping to the sides. He's wearing glasses and a simple clerical clothing. His eyes are warm and pale, too kind for someone like you. Something is wrong. You feel heavy as if a giant hand was pressing you down. The skin on your face is burning. Perhaps unconsciously you expected something like this, as a vampire walking into a cathedral. Only it's not the building or God making you feel like you're burning alive. It's the man, the priest. Welcome, my child. The priest's tone is kind, but the rising panic inside is telling you that kindness is not for the likes of you. Let's confront him. The only way to understand these painful feelings is to push forward and confront the priest. As you step closer to the priest, panic rises inside you. The emotions are hard to control. Fear, anger, pain, all trying to wrestle you in different directions away. Can I help you? Are you okay? The priest talks to you like he would a lost vagrant who has chosen to enter the house of God. I'm sorry, Father. I'm so sorry. It's alright. Do you wish to pray? I guess I could try to do a voice for him, but I can't really do do voices too well. It'd be like, it's all right. Do you wish to pray? <laughs> like, it's so bad. It's simply too much. You mutter something incoherent in reply. You don't sound like a vampire, none did being made powerful by mortal blood. You're just another sad, confused, lost soul. You turn around and stagger away, only feeling like yourself once you're back on, on the street outside. You stand on the sidewalk, confused and scared. No enemies seem to be attacking you. The priest didn't follow you. The night air is wet with the smells of the city, the same as every night. How did it feel? You look at the man speaking to you. He's well-dressed, if a little archaic. Dark-haired, handsome like a character from an old movie. He smiles as if he knows something you don't. You glance around. There are people on the street. You don't appear to be in immediate danger. Why does it hurt so much? That's the question I wanted to talk to you about. Let me introduce myself. My name is Benoit, ben, Bennett, Benoit, Bennett, ben, I don't know, Bennett. I'm just gonna call him Ben, Ben Seagal. We share many things in common, even if you don't know me. Ben offers his hand to you. Yeah, sure, we'll do all specs. We're gonna use our vampiric senses. Ben is a vampire, that much is clear. He is using his blood to stimulate the functions of a living body, but the rhythm of his heartbeat reveals its artificial nature. Would you mind sitting with me for a moment? Ben points to a park bench nearby in darkness because of a broken streetlight. Wary, you decide to follow him. Only an enemy totally unconcerned with the masquerade would attack you here. Ben sits down and you follow suit. For a moment, you both contemplate the cathedral in silence. I know how it feels, what you just felt. I've experienced it myself many times. For a moment, you consider how to respond. It's clear Ben sent the invitation to come here and, and orchestrated this little setup. Why did you invite me? What's the point? Why did you go to the trouble of getting me here? We share a connection, you and I. I'll explain it later, but right now the important thing is that it's so much easier to show than tell, than to tell. I wanted you to meet Father Anthony, or see him, experience him. Did you wonder why it felt like that? 
Is it a supernatural power? Was it some kind of supernatural power? No, no, not at all. I don't think so. It's his faith that makes you feel like that. He's safe in his belief, while you are the one, dam one of the damned. Do you ever wonder what's the role of a vampire in God's creation? You stop to think. Of course you wondered what this is all about. Whether it's about God or nature, you don't really know what being a vampire means. That's the trouble with the masquerade. A human faced with a human problem can go online and find something that helps. You can't. The masquerade means that everything there is to know about your condition is secret, hidden away. You're left relying on the unreliable opinions of people like Ben. Suddenly, Ben takes your hand and presses it against his chest. As he stares into your eyes, you feel his heart stop. My heart no longer beats, yet I move, I talk. Is that how God intended us to be? No, it can't be. No, he didn't. I know he didn't. This is wrong. Yes, I agree. The question is, can there be salvation for the likes of us? Sometimes I'm skeptical, too, but in Father Anthony's presence, I know faith is real. I know it because it hurts so much. But perhaps you have questions about faith in our kind? Yes, what are we? There is the usual story which most of us believed, especially before modern times. Cain was the first murderer. As punishment, God cursed him to walk in darkness and carry his mark. Cain passed on his curse as he drank the blood of the living and thus we were born. God's curse passed on to someone new with each embrace. Maybe it's true. We all have our lineages, our sires, and the sires of our sires. If you trace those lineages all the way to the top, you can find Cain, the original vampire. I suppose God is cruel. The curse perpetuates itself, leading to new evils. This is a lot to take in. All these myths, hard to know what to believe. I know it's overwhelming. It was for me when I first met Father Anthony. I know there are others like him whose faith shines like a beacon. Priests, old ladies, children, anyone can have that conviction inside them. This is too much. You expect me to go along with all this insanity? Ben nods patiently. Let's meet again in a few nights here at the cathedral. We can talk more after you've thought it through. You leave Ben sitting in the shadow of the cathedral, contemplating what lies within. It would be easier to ignore his words without the reality of what you experienced. Father Anthony was holy. You know it to be true. But what does that mean? Okay. Let's go. It's a quiet, moody internet cafe. Half of its space serves as a comfy coffee bar these days, but behind a glass wall, it still has a space dedicated to rows of PCs. From the street, you, can, you notice tired adults in casual clothes typing away absentmindedly and some bored kids wasting the late evening hours on colorful online games. If Sophie's intel is to be believed, this is where Hope has set up her haven. One of the waiters is standing outside the building, gazing at the sky with a smartphone in one hand and a vape pen in the other. You approach the man and tell him. I'm, I was supposed to meet Hope here? If I told you I was supposed to meet Hope here, what would you say to me? I'd probably tell you I'm surprised. People are usually far more discreet about seeing her. The man slowly takes a drag from his e-cig, sizing you up and down in silence. After a long, awkward moment, he raises his voice again. Come, right this way. He gets back into the cafe, and you follow his lead. When you make your way through the space with computers, no one averts their gaze from the spreadsheets, emails, Facebook profiles, or games of Fortnite. It's a common sight, one you wouldn't have paid much attention to a few weeks ago, but now it seems so unnervingly quaint. Would they still be spending their time like this if they were immortal? The waiter unlocks an unassuming door at the end of the room and lets you inside. You two swiftly make your way through a labyrinth of sterile, gray corridors, taking confusing twists and turns. Feels like you're traveling into a different world, crossing one invisible portal after another. Eventually, you reach your destination. Your guide motions you to enter a dark room with a lone source of pale light, a computer screen in the distance beckoning you to come closer. As you do, you hear the door shutting behind your back and a short chuckle echoing behind it. Is this the place? Nothing else to do but sit on a chair in front of the computer. The monitor displays a modern chat application. A cursor is blinking in the user nickname entry fill fill field ah, in the middle of the screen, obviously expecting you to input your handle. After brief consideration, you type in. 
Your name, Lamar. Better play it straight and prove you have nothing to hide as a gesture of goodwill. After a few seconds, the chat window opens and messages start appearing on the screen in quick succession. Hostage executioner. Oh, fuck. Wow, this is gone for a bit. Just to be clear, I don't have a wank rag, Lemo. Sure. No, for real. Lemo was meant for Jerry, of course, not much longer. Yeah, Jerry is the chat MVP. I mean, I've admitted to far worse things on here. God, I'm so horny. Not sure why I'd need a, to lie about this one. Oh my god, literally, who cares? You and me both, bozo. Wait, who is Lamar? Lamar, no idea. A new user was in here a second before. Okay. Yeah. The chat goes silent. Everyone's seemingly waiting for you to say something before proceeding. This must be a close-knit group. Better say something before they kick you out. I'm looking for Hope. Looking for Hope. Is she here? Who the fuck are you? This is meant to be a safe channel, investigating what went wrong here. How did they even get in here? Stay calm. Can you get their location? Yeah, I can't go. Regret dumbass the day you decided to spy on us. Alright, let's try to get the chat under control with presents. Time to teach them with some respects. Your blood fires up. Ancient power starts coursing through your veins. Fingers tapping the keyboard buttons on their own. You people better stay quiet if you know what's good for you. You have no idea who you're messing with. You will obey me. The chat goes silent once again, and then it explodes. Guess your powers don't work online. Go figure. You know your cheeks would turn blood red now if they still could. You've come to the wrong chat room, motherfucker. <laughs> I don't know what that voice is, but this is the voice. A ridiculous whisper rings out next to your ear, and the grip under your head gets even under your head gets even tighter. You start struggling, but when you but even with your newfound supernatural strength, you're having trouble breaking out. This isn't a normal human you're dealing with. List the words. Sophie sent me here. Sophie sent me here. Langley. Hmm. Hmm. The hand holding your chin shifts its position slightly. Don't struggle, or I will break your windpipe. Or my phone, which would then be even worse for you. Sounds of a camera shutter and light flashing. Did they just take some selfies with you? Alright, that's enough fun. I'm letting you go. We can have a talk. Don't do anything stupid, Mr. Intruder. Pretty please. A mysterious assailant loosens their grip on you and gently pushes you away. You quickly turn to take a good look at them. Let me just finish this. It's a pale blonde woman in her twenties, giving you slightly a slight ah giving you slightly judgmental looks while rapidly tapping away at her phone screen. First you notice her outrageous outfit seemingly thrown together from random thrift store finds. Then you take note of her tattoos, a sprawling tapestry of odd patterns and designs covering every visible part of her body. At first glance, it all seems aimless, but it's a consistent sense of style upon closer inspection. Her eyes focus on you for a second. Dude! Uh, look how cute that outfit is! That is cute as fuck. She's cute. Gave you a scare, huh? Sorry, that's what you get for entering a lady's haven without her permission. And she's back to her phone. With her relatively small build, it's hard to believe you had trouble overpowering her physically. But then again, nothing is what it seems when it comes to the undead. And even compared to the vampires you've met so far, she comes off as eccentric, curious presence. As an eccentric, curious presence. She shoots you another glance, noticing you're still cautious of her. Gum yourself, man. I won't pull anything like this anymore. It was just a feel stupid saying it that out loud. A vibe check. 
Vibe check? Yeah, I got a glimpse of your vibe on the internet, and in a dangerous situation, I'd say I've got a pretty good idea about who you really are. I'm Hope, by the way. If you're here, you've probably heard of me. So I went ahead and skipped the pleasantries. But come to think of it, I might have skipped too many of those. Yeah, she definitely fits the description you were given by Sophie. I still can't believe you got so mad online. You actually tried to use your power on people talking trash about you from who knows where. Jesus. But you know what? But you know, I kind of respect that dedication. It's amusing. Anyway, don't worry about the chat. It was all a game to us. No hard feelings, okay? I'll introduce, I'll introduce you properly, properly later. On the monitor, the chatter continues normally. Your visit is like yesterday's news, no longer relevant to anything. But, uh, look, if we're going to talk about you, you should have something to say, too. What are you doing here? About time, she asked. Note to self, she really loves the sound of her own voice. I'm building a coterie. I'm looking for people to join my coterie. Kodri. Been there, done that. Not interested, then less. She takes a closer look at you. Her eyes go wide. Wait, 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 wait! Shit! Are you new? Are you the new Langley plaything? Words seem to be getting, getting around fast. Of course you are. It was obvious the second Langley got her hands on a new servant, she'd start building a network. Hmm. 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 Your emissions tell me that could really come in handy when... But Langley, that's a risky game. This kind of ambition attracts too much attention. Piss off. But then again, fucking Kara. Mm -hmm. She seems to be having a spirited argument with herself, only parts of it audible. Is it just you, or do her facial expressions and body language change a bit between one sentence and the other? Before you make certain it's not just your eyes playing tricks on you, she focuses half of her attention back on you. The other half, of course, is still obsessed with her smartphone. Listen, I'm not saying I'm not interested in uh, cooperation, but before I make a decision, I need to make sure you sort of understand me and that I sort of understand you. And since I was planning to put on the show before you came here, I propose a little game. Hope absentmindedly spins her phone in her hand. Considering how to put her thoughts into words, then she approaches a switch on the wall and flicks it. Neon lights flare up, illuminating the room. You take a look around. The room is certainly unique. It looks like a butcher's room, repurposed to be a living space. The modern computer in front of you starkly, con starkly contrasts the ominous industrial walls. At the back, there's an overwrought bed covered in velvet, with meat hooks hanging above it. On top of the bed sheets, you notice what seems to be pieces of an elaborate S&M equipment. And a camera. Wait a minute. You want my help? Moderate my cam show. Cam show? Your eyebrows twitch involuntarily. This is definitely not the kind of request you expected to hear tonight. She notices your confusion. Take it or leave it, buddy. You just became a kindred, but you want to become my partner in crime. Show me you can handle yourself while watching my back in my everyday environment. She's serious. The show starts in ten minutes. If you think yourself better than this, better walk out the door right now. I won't hold a grudge. I've got better things to do. As if to prove it, she looks at something displayed on her phone and cracks a brief grin. Another reply typed down with absurd speed. Tap, 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 tap. 90 minutes. It's now or never. Show moderator. Risk of violating the masquerade. Hi, content mornings. Oh, yes. So do you take the job? Why the hell not? Hope brightens up and her smile looks surprisingly sincere. Excellent. I hope you find this interesting in more ways than one. Alright, give me a second. She spends a minute setting up the computer you used before, then urges you to sit down. The explanation of the moderator's functionalities is simple. It boils down to ignoring anyone who doesn't disrupt the chat, banning anyone who does, and kicking anyone who's causing minor trouble. Five minutes later, she's already online, sitting on her bed in a very provocative pose. Is it a, it is a sex show, isn't it? Her voice, previously hushed, rings out with full force. 
How are you doing tonight, hopefuls? You peek at the chat. Tempted to try out the kick and ban prompts as soon as possible, but obviously you won't punish someone for a little dirty talk. Thank you! Today's show is quite special. Please welcome our new moderator, Lamar. At least the community here seems to be a bit more welcoming this time. Looks like this place has an established hazing ritual. Or maybe they hope they and Hope came up with one specifically for you. Who knows? You decide to stay silent. Eventually people stop riffing on you and focus entirely on the star of the show. Alright, let's start this one with a bang, shall we? So this is where the strip show starts? You raise your head, curious about what kind of performance she's going for. First she opens her mouth and reveals her retractable fangs in front of the camera. Right off the bat, the online audience is treated to a sight of her wholly human set of teeth returning into a monster's maw. The image is both revolting and fascinating. She raises her left wrist for everyone to see and then bites. The fangs immediately turn her arm into a horrifying, gory mess. It's unclear if she's used them to slash or bite, but one thing is for sure, no ordinary human could cause such damage. If an ordinary human suffered such a wound, you'd expect a geyser of blood to appear, too, but it doesn't. Hope's technically a corpse, so it's impossible. She flashes a monstrous smile and starts smearing Vitae all over her hand to maximize the impact of the violent image. Then she starts drinking it up. She makes it a point to make the sight as gruesome as possible, looking, for a hyena f looking like a hyena feasting on a corpse. The contrast of her behavior with her look of an Instagram model is stunning. Once she's done, she, reve she reveals her wrist to the camera for the last time. She starts making theatrical gestures with her right hand as the wound begins to mend. Shortly after, the wound is gone. It's like a magician's trick. Her left hand looks like nothing bad ever happened to it. Here's an appetizer. First blood to kick off the show. While you're wondering what the hell is going on, Hope catches a glimpse of your bewildered face and turns into your direction. How's that? How is that for an opening? This is not. You're shooting snuff! Come on, just because it's trying to dress of violence doesn't mean it's snuff. A brief moment of awkward silence. Besides, if I was shooting snuff, I wouldn't mend the wound. If you expect a strip show, yes, sorry to disappoint. This is more like a live streamed digital art. The erotic subtext is there, of course. You peek at the chat, they're going wild. But the eroticism, eroticism is not the key here, it's vampirism. It's a new frontier, a living art installation in the early 90s. The Japanese artists kept producing these videotapes with beautiful women committing gory har harakiri. There's, those are an inspiration. She bears her fangs again in a TV screen. But I've no interest in auto-destruction or turning myself into a victim. This is a celebration of a body I love, not self-inflicted punishment. The audience came here to marvel at the beautiful vampire and her awe-inspiring powers. Mending wounds is just one of these powers. The people watching can pay to see more. Oh, and don't worry. The only things the audience can see and hear are the, are the things I allow them to. We can talk freely. Just remember to moderate the chat, will you? High risk of violating the masquerade. What a joke. She's blatantly breaching it in front of anonymous viewers. Still speechless, you turn your attention to the screen. You let the guy vent his excitement. Seems harmless. 
A special message appears on the chat log, claiming somebody has successfully sponsored the first goal of the show. Hope smiles and picks up a bag of blood from underneath the bed. It must have been retrieved from a blood bank. She showcases the label to the camera for everyone to see. Hope pours all the contents of the bag into her throat. You have no doubt it's real blood, but wonder why the viewers would be so satisfied with something that's so easy to fake. Don't worry, it pays well enough. You don't even bother to tell her this is not what you're thinking about. It's safe to assume she knows. So, what do you know about the kindred in the internet? Have they told you anything? While she is waiting for someone to sponsor her next vampiric feat, she decides to start a conversation. Is there a vampire internet? <laughs> if you find something that looks like vampire internet, stay away. See, some of us used to experiment with our own secure networks. We tried to build our own information hubs, social networks, everything. She's still working the phone in one hand while looking for something under the bed with the other. On how many things can she concentrate at one time exactly? Then one day the NSA got the in. Turns out elders never really got the hang of proper security practices. Or the sigils they used to smear on their screens didn't exactly work as it advertised. Then of course all the other three-lettered intelligence agencies in the world got the intel. And a lot of them decided the bloodsuckers were, part, were the perfect new enemies for our post-9-11 times. The second inquisition came into being. Ever heard of it? A lot of our kind died just because they were too present online. Right now, the remains of our old network serve as government honeypots, kept alive to attract fledglings and hunt them down. You post a certain keyword on Twitter or Facebook, you get tagged for investigation. You fit certain patterns, you get tagged for investigation. So there is a certain thrill in becoming an online presence without detracting attention from authorities. She stretches on the bed. I hope you are still monitoring the chat. Of course not. You're not as good at dividing your attention as she is. You correct your mistake and check the recent messages. Good job. She's keeping close tabs on you. Anyway, yeah. When the Nosferatu admitted to Camarilla their network got com compromised, the elders went batshit insane. Internet communications became strictly forbidden. There were executions. A lot of people who use social media to secretly contact their mortal families and lovers got off. That goes without saying. But if you weren't careful, even the most innocent web of usage could result in being punished with the final death. Thanks to user Dick Steel, the next goal has just gotten successfully funded. She raises her hand, three fingers up, two fingers up, one finger up. The countdown ends and she immediately disappears from the screen like a ghost. You can still see her on the bed, but the live feed indicates there's nobody there. When you deeply focus on the digital image, you swear you can make out some unusual glitching where her silhouette should be, but could, but it could, it could very well be just a placebo. You ready for this? Three, two, one. A flash of the camera. The instant she reappears on the screen, she takes a selfie, sticking her tongue out in a provocative manner. The chat room explodes and cheers again. She is their vampire queen. You briefly wonder about her being glued to the screen. Is this the fantasy everyone is here for? A girl showing off cheap magic tricks while lazily browsing her social media? You realize you are way out of your depth here. Meanwhile, Hope decides to continue her lecture. Those were some wild times, especially in New York. While most of them have no clue as to our real nature, a lot of clandestine, clandestine organizations have classified us as national threats. And since this is where the towers fell, the agencies are very much present around here, looking for easy PR victories. The last SI raid here was just a few years ago. It was a big one, stirred up the hornet's nest something fierce. 
But although it's 2019, New, New York City is ruled by someone who got embraced before World War fucking 2. And the cam as a whole got really spooked and swore off the internet. Of course, they're not dumb and understand that you can't really coexist with modern kind without the internet. It's a gray zone right now, like piracy, technically frowned upon, but let the one without sin cast the first stone. The SI is a real threat, no joke, but in many senses, the darkest place is right under the candle. You, get another, you take another look at the screen. Familiar nickname pops up. You give the guy a kick for spamming the chat. The messages are deleted so fast. Hope might not have even noticed. A duty carried out well. You're surprised to feel an inkling of pride. Oh yeah, fun fact about being a vampire. We can sweat and pee if we just exert ourselves really hard. Some of us can even orgasm. We can even cry, but only tears of blood. It's something I always dreamed of doing when I was 14. So romantic. And it drives them crazy. As proof of her words, a scarlet tear starts running down her face. The chat goes wild. This seems to be exactly the kind of thing they've been waiting for. And banned. Just to be clear, you realize that we're doing what we're doing here is a blatant ble breach of the masquerade, right? I honestly expected you to leave or inform somebody by now, but you haven't, have you? You try to focus on the chat. A familiar nickname is displayed on the screen. One more kick, one more familiar message. You double check. That's the same message she sent out the last time. Is he copy pasting it or something? Looks like Mr. Masochist needs a longer break. After you ban him, you hear Hope's voice. Good job handling that guy. Great. If nothing else works out, seems like you fit this job at, least, at the very least. In any case, the last goal has just been funded. It's time for the great finale. This is what you've all been waiting for, right? Her voice has changed. She gets closer to the camera, letting her face fill the frame of the live, fe live feed. Her mesmerizing eyes are focused purely on the viewers. You wanted blood. Come out into the streets. Claw out of your neighbor's throats. Slash their veins and drink up. Hope's presence becomes absolutely horrifying and it influences the chat in some incom incomprehensible way. Everyone starts typing like they're possessed. Liberate yourself from the shackles of ordinary mortality. Make them scream. Feel the warmth of their entrails. What the hell is she doing to those people? What have you gotten yourself into? Transcend your bodies. Release the message of the ho of hope into the world. She jerks violently for a second and then falls down on the bed like a marionette that had just had its strings severed. She exhales loudly a few times and laughs. When she does, the room goes dark again. All right, that's enough. Instead of count continuing, she does something with her phone. The stream ends and the chat instantly becomes dead quiet. Let me take over. The atmosphere in the room has completely changed. She's already put herself together and stood up. Now she's walking towards you. That's vulgar, what the fuck just happened? Guess the show's over, everyone relax and go home. Hostage, I swear on the swear of my father's grave, one day you will, I will find you and kick the everlasting shit out of you. After every line she delivers, she changes her voice, the way she puts her lips together, and even the way she moves. You've caught glimpses of her acting this way, but now, but only now have you started to figure it out. But it's impossible. That's, but that's impossible. I'm immortal. 
I'm bored. I'm separated from most vampires in the city by generational chasm, and I'm so goddamn lonely. The internet used to be my only friend. Years ago... Oh. She's reading. I'm not reading in the voice. I'm just... You could add info dump delivery service. Years ago, I started researching tul tulpas, collective, in collective unconsciousness, all the mumble-jumble at the intersection of psychology and spirituality, and I decided to experiment. The show was fake. A few years later, I was an Instagram fashionista, a successful erotic model, a vital part of pop culture comrade, comment tarrant, comment tarrant, a viral shitposter, a cryptocurrency expert, and honey legend. All of my internet slaves selves started signal boosting each other, have paving the way for new ones. I became a one-woman empire, surrounded by legions of psycho fans. The chat was fake. That's me. Some may think of it as a dissociative identity disorder, but that's bullshit. Everyone online has online alter egos they buried. I just resurrect them, give birth to new ones, and let them crossbreed. The constant tapping at the phone, even during the show, somehow she's capable of impersonating an entire chat room. Yet literally a perfect angel. I don't even have a self that could dissociate or be mentally ill. I'm a host, a living database. A literally perfect angel. I live because I find it fun to be an information conduit, to process trends and support the ones I deem worthy. There was no masquerade violation. She was showing off her skills all along. She put you in a world of pure fiction, the same way she was testing you back when she attacked you from the back. Damn, she's good at this. At Melt David Champ Chapman. Of course, you can just ignore what I'm saying and decide I'm just another deranged Malkavian. But hey, annihilation of the self is the only way to survive in the 21st century. At Android of Notre Dame. If I am ever, if there ever was an era that demanded things of beautiful people transcending beyond humanity and inspiring others to do the same, it's this one. A manhole mermaid, although for now because of masquerade my audience is quite limited. Speaking of, you want to be the star of my next movie? Sure, why not? Sure, why not? A manhole mermaid. I have a hunch you're just saying that. Still, hey on the way, this is too this too is transcending beyond self. And this is the question, but yeah, your test is over. Now the question is, do I want to work with you? She puts away her phone for the first time since you've met her and gives you a good hard look. I'd vibe check vivo. Guess I can give it a shot, yeah. You're not that dumb, but you're not that boring. And you're kind of cute. And our doll XOXO. Don't worry, no more modding jobs. Mods get attacked. And that's always bad news. She grabs your arm and starts leading you out of her room. At, a G at GPs, I put you through enough shit. Next time I'll let you in on a little job I'm doing. We'll hit the streets and you'll see why Sophie told you to contact me. She leads you through a labyrinth of grey corridors. It's a different route than the one you've made your way through in. At unconscious diagram of psycho... psychic event. The city is so much more than what its elites consider real. Stick with me and I'll guide you to places Camarilla elders couldn't reach in a hundred years. She leads you out of the building into the back alleys. A shitty trailer voice. Even if someone else rules the streets, we will rule the information highways. This is the power of hope. She lets out a theatrical laugh and disappears. You don't even notice when she leaves you alone, but you assume everything went as well as it could. A new ally, the power of hope. As you walk off into the night, everything around you feels a little less tangible than it did a few hours ago. Let's rest. Not long after you wake up tonight, Gregory knocks on the door of your apartment. Hey, I came to pick you up. Hey, I came to pick you up. Miss Langley wants to see you. He's gonna be British. <laughs> Terrible British accent, too. All my accents are terrible. People who watch- if anyone actually watches this, low-key, like if you actually are watching this, thank you for putting up with my shitty accents. I have fun doing them though. Well, my freedom was good while it lasted. Those last two nights were nice. I had freedom and shift initiative. Good while it lasted, I guess. He smiles apologetically. 
Don't don't shoot don't shoot the messenger. Whatever. The car is waiting, shall we? <laughs> I don't know. You wrestle with the same thoughts as a few nights ago. Maybe you should just leave. Disappear. Let Sophie find somebody else to to employ. Then you remember the Anarch Thug being cut down by Quadar and how close you were to the same fate, not even a week ago, and that it might still happen if you step out of line. You follow suit. And with your previous visit here, Sophie seems not entirely present when you enter. Her eyes are locked onto one of the paintings in the room. You're pretty sure it was here earlier, but she was behaving as if she's seeing it for the first time in her life, entirely entranced. Gregory, Gregory clears his throat. Sophie turns to the both of you, a bit of irritation in her countenance that soon gives way to a pleasant, warm smile. And I think that's where we're going to end it for tonight. Thank you for watching.